So Daphne, it's a distinct pleasure to have you here. I'm sure you are a hero to many of the people in this room, myself included. <laughs> Thank you. So you're one of the earliest founders of this field. It, it must be phenomenal to have seen it grown. So what are your thoughts on how it's expanded and evolved? I think uh, we're in a golden age of machine learning and it's a tremendous privilege to be in this field at this time to see how much impact machine learning can have on so many different applications in the world. I think there is, um, the, the synergy is created by the combination of just much larger amounts of data that, than we've ever had available in a number of areas, um, the power of cloud computing, and um, the availability of really smart people like yourselves who are able to make an impact in some really, really hard problems. And it seems like that was a strong inspiration to developing Coursera. I mean, now this idea of MOOCs is just it's just given. Everyone's creating an online course. When, when Coursera started, this idea, this notion was radical and revolutionary and frankly kind of insane. <laughs> it, it, it was kind of insane. Uh, when we started, people looked at us as if we were totally crazy. I mean, you're going to get top universities to give up the stuff that's core to who they are, their faculty, their content, their brands, the stuff that they're charging $40,000 a year for, and you're going to get them to give that away to everyone for free. Um, people said, that was not ever going to happen, but I think uh, we were very fortunate to partner initially with some forward-thinking universities who were willing to take that bold step, recognizing that that only increased their footprint and their reach and uh, made them more attractive to people who were interested in the on-campus experience with the face-to-face -face interaction with the faculty. But you're right, now it's kind of almost a given. And I've had people come to me and say, so you've been doing MOOCs for about 10, 15 years now, right? Like, no, really, we started in 2012. So it's really more like seven, more like five to six. But people think it's just been around forever because it's so much part of the day-to-day -day life. So what, what inspired you to do it? Why did you feel it was necessary? I mean, to be perfectly frank, there you were, a professor at Stanford. You get the, some of the most elite students in the world applying. What, what was this drive for democratization? I think it came from two different parts. First um, was the fact that I figured that the, I realized that the experience that we were providing to on-campus students was not really the best that we could do because we were effectively walking into a large lecture hall with 300 students and giving them the same lecture that we've given the year before and the year before that and the year before that with minor edits. And maybe we could give them a better experience if they got the basic content online and then they came into class to have more interaction. And then I realized that if we're giving that opportunity to our on-campus students, why not give that opportunity to everybody else? Because it was a really, you know, it was a good experience to get access to all of this content um, that most people um, will never have an opportunity to have. Um, they don't have the privilege of attending university like Stanford or Princeton um, or Penn. And so we put um, the courses out there. We didn't know what would happen. This was in the fall of 2011. We thought maybe a few hundred people would sign up, maybe a few thousand. And within a matter of weeks, with minimal advertising, there were um, 100,000 people or more in each of the three courses that we, that we launched. And that was, I think, a real um, sort of eye-opener for all of us because we didn't realize, I think, the depth and extent of the demand and what also was apparent was that it wasn't just the numbers, it was also the fact that these people came from pretty much every country, every age group, and every walk of life. And so we were really democratizing education and filling a profound need for people to better themselves. And that's what really led us to take this out of Stanford and do something that was much bigger than we could do as Stanford faculty, which is work with multiple universities to make a much broader spectrum of education available to uh, what is at this point 30 million people worldwide. And there's, you've definitely tapped into this, as you mentioned, like this need and this desire to have a quality education by people who are very capable. Yes. I, I've, I've seen some studies about how the people who perform the best in your Coursera courses are not students from Stanford or probably wouldn't have even gotten into Stanford. That is or true. Or be able to afford it, right? So there is a lot of movement around the democratization, not just of the education, but of the tools. So there's a lot of platforms, AI in a box, ML in a box. What are the, the trade-offs that you think there might be here, or any concerns you might have? 
I, first of all, I think democratization of tools, um, machine learning tools, is a wonderful thing. It allows us to tackle a much broader spectrum of problems than we could if there were only a small subset of people who had the capability to really do the kind of intricate programming that honestly was what was required even five or seven years ago when I went to Coursera. You need to be a really expert programmer to program machine learning tools. And now with the kinds of toolkits that places are uh, putting out, the, you know, the TensorFlow from Google and others, um, it's really democratized access to a lot more people. That being said, the models that people are building are kind of tricky and hard to understand. And it's tempting to just sort of throw stuff into a machine learning algorithm and magic just happens. And you don't need to worry about how it works on the inside. And a lot of people tend to not take enough care in how they debug their tools and how they ensure that the, the algorithms are really doing the right thing, including on data that's not exactly the kind that it was trained on. And so it's a really difficult challenge to ensure that the tools are applied well. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to continue educating people into not just how to use these tools, but how to know when they're working. So just moving a bit from these ideas and these concepts to implementation, um, what do you see as the main challenges to established companies integrating AI and machine learning? So it's, you know, if you're a startup and you've, you know, you're organically built around AI and machine learning, that's one thing. But if you are a 50, 100-year-old company and now you know that you have to compete by integrating it, where do you think is a good place to start? What are some challenges you face? Well, I'm going to start with a challenge that everyone faces, which is just the dearth of people who are able to do this. I mean, even with all the democratization of tools, hiring talented people in machine learning and data science remains a challenge, I think, for any company. And so that, I think, is something that everyone faces. That challenge specifically is, in fact, larger for bigger companies because um, everyone wants to be in kind of a small, nimble startup. And, and with the exception of a few large companies that have really developed a brand reputation as being at the forefront of um, machine learning research, um, there are n most large companies are not as attractive of a destination to a lot of young people and so I think that's a challenge and then of course I think you I think alluded to the the cultural challenges of companies that have been doing things in a very um, you know the same way and it's been working well for them and it's hard to sort of do something that could be very disruptive to how they do business and uh, take away jobs or ch completely transform jobs that people have been doing and they think they're doing it pretty well and it's a very difficult transformation for companies to say, you know what, we're just not doing it that way anymore. Right, and there, there is definitely a mentality shift, I think, that we need to see here. A lot of organizations and companies are trying to embrace that change. Mm -hmm. but as you mentioned, it's, it's quite difficult. And you've sort of made that shift yourself from an academic role at Stanford mm -hmm. to, your, to leading Coursera. So as somebody who's operated on both sides, what could academia learn from business and what can business learn from academia? The two are very different worlds. They proceed by and large on very different time scales. In academia, we have the luxury of taking on long-term problems. We don't have to worry as much about uh, where exactly it's going to be applied and by whom. Whereas in most industrial applications, you really worry about the, the next deadline, the next product launch. Um, and that, I think, is a two-edged sword. It has advantages and disadvantages. The, the need to deliver on, um, on performance from a machine learning algorithm is actually a significant focuser of attention. So you really are working towards a very clear goal, and, and that forces you to, to be very, um, very deliberate and not worry about a lot of distractions. At the same time, it does, in some cases, prevent you from taking a big step back and thinking about what are some of the more fundamental questions that if I could only solve those, they might not necessarily impact the bottom line next quarter, but they might impact the bottom line in a much more fundamental way in a year. The best companies, I think, are the ones that try and balance those two um, and think about what, um, how do I ensure that work that is longer term is also rewarded um, internally within the company, even though it doesn't affect next quarter's results. And I think that's something that everyone could benefit from. And academia could also take more of a balance about how do I 
give students and faculty the ability to work on more focused projects that do have a more direct impact, maybe not on the bottom line, but on societal problems. One of the reasons that I actually moved away from academia and decided to stay in industry is largely because of the fact that it's very, it's challenging to do translational work, something that is translated into practice in an academic environment. Tech transfer organizations and academic institutions are not always the best track for getting ideas out from academia into industrial applications and into the real world. Whereas in industry, there is a better trajectory for that. And you still have, again, depending on the company, the opportunity to also do some longer term thinking at the same time. But it's a challenge, and they both have advantages. And how do you get that balance? Right, is difficult. right. And there, there's everyone who's been on both sides of the fence, myself included, mm -hmm. we've, we face that struggle. So it's really deep, maybe um, philosophically or intellectually mm -hmm. satisfying work that may not actually see the light of day, as you mentioned, in terms of a real world setting. And then we go back and forth and sort of mm -hmm. vacillate between going into industry where, you know, it's sometimes it's just about delivering versus chasing a, a really interesting concept. And what I hope, and, and I think a lot of us in this room are in a fortunate position where our jobs get to be a bit of both, myself mm -hmm. included, yeah. right? Where we can actually think the big questions, but then figure out what it means in reality. And, and you yourself have followed this really fascinating career. So what, what sparked your interest in human health applications? So why, why move to Calico? So when I uh, decided that my time at Coursera had come to an end, the company was and is on a terrific trajectory, and I wanted to go back to this machine learning revolution that was happening around us, I wanted first and foremost to work, as I did at Coursera, on applications of machine learning that I felt were making the world a better place. So while there's amazing applications of machine learning in all sorts of areas, I wanted something that had more of a societal impact. And healthcare was one of the areas which clearly falls into that category. But the other thing that made healthcare particularly attractive to me was the fact that I think it, in some ways, is the next big data frontier. When I went to um, Coursera back in 2011, 2012, a big data set in biology and health was, oh, 200 samples. And there is, you know, you, certainly you can apply logistic regression and random forest to data sets of that kind, but there's really only a limit of, of what you can do with that uh, scope of data. Now we're in a place where biological and medical data sets are just exploding in terms of the quality and quantity of the data. So there's now human cohorts like the UK Biobank that have 500,000 deeply phenotyped and genotyped individuals, including longitudinal um, health records from the, from the National Health Service in, in the UK. You have biological data sets that are derived from a combination of CRISPR, next-gen sequencing, and um, various high-throughput measurement technologies that are millions of samples. Um, and so we are now in a position where you could finally start to apply some really high-end machine learning to solve fundamental problems in, in human health and biology and, and in science. But in order to really deliver on that promise, you can't just, um, as I mentioned earlier, take your biological data, toss it into your favorite deep neural network architecture, and magic just happens. There's some people who think that's true, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, in order to really deliver on that promise, you need people who are bilingual, people who can listen to the description of a, of a problem or even just a, a, an idea in one area, in the problem area, and say, oh, wait a minute. We can really think of this as a machine learning problem if we look at it this way. And in order to do that, you really need both the understanding of the domain and the understanding of machine learning techniques. In a lot of areas, such people are relatively readily found. I mean, if we think about computer vision, it's an area that all of us can relate to because we understand the world around us, we kind of see it, and so it doesn't make us an expert in computer vision, but at least we kind of understand what, that, what the problems are and how one can potentially formulate them as machine learning problems. In biology, that's much, much harder. And there are not, unfortunately, an awful lot of people who really speak both languages. So for me, this was a very natural place to go because I've been working in this field since before it was popular, since 2001, um, right around the time of the first human genome sequence. 
and the first microarrays and all those things that were sort of very new at the time. Uh, and I think it's really important that there be more people who are willing to learn both languages so that they can move into the space and make a real impact on what is probably one of the most fundamental questions that we have as human beings, which is how we operate and how we can make ourselves better and healthier and live healthier lives. And is that the mandate of Calico? What's from a 80,000 feet view, what are the big questions you're trying to answer? So at Calico, we are working on, as you said in your introduction, on extending health span. We, want, uh, we are looking to design interventions that allow all of us to live longer, healthier lives. Um, the goal isn't to make us immortal. I, I don't think any of us think this is uh, sort of on the horizon. But um, if you think about some centenarians, for instance, they live active, healthy lifestyles um, until they're whatever, 105, 110, and then one night they go to sleep and that's it. And I think that's the kind of life that I would like to have as opposed to the sort of decay into decrepitude that a lot of people unfortunately are facing. And we're about to hit this societal crisis. As baby boomers here in the United States are starting to hit retirement age, the number of people who are older than 65 is, will soon exceed the number of children. Uh, worldwide, the number of people, uh, the percentage of people above the age of 60 is about to hit 22% um, from 11% just a few years ago. So these are all people who are going to need um, to who are going to need increasing amounts of medical care and treatment. And if we can find interventions that allow them to stay healthy and active for a longer part of their lives, it's not only a wonderful boon to them, but also to their families and to the society um, as a way of potentially ameliorating this incredible increase in the cost of health care, which is not only in the United States, but worldwide. This increase in number of, in the proportion of the aging population is not just a US problem or US and Europe. Um, even in even in countries like Af even in countries like India or continents like Africa, where you think this is a young people's uh, region, it's not. That same demographic phenomenon is happening there because of interventions previously invented that allow people to hit that age of 60, 65, 70, where we don't have the next level of interventions yet that allow them to continue to live healthy past that age. I think also el elderly quality of life is a strong focus in Japan, yeah. where they have a declining birth population, increasing aging population. Mm -hmm. And they will reach a point where there are literally more elderly people than there are young people. Even in China, because yeah. of the one child rule, yeah. we have a, a much larger number of older people mm -hmm. than younger people to take care of them. So it's really a global problem it's a global you're tackling problem. here. It's yeah. really interesting. So on, on that end, you had mentioned earlier about needing people who are bilingual. And I, mm -hmm. I really like that, that analogy, um, because it's not just about having this deep learning expertise. And it's not just about having this biological knowledge to combine the two. Yeah. And, and we're seeing a lot of discussion on AI and its impact in industries in which it wasn't originally used in, so technology. And there's this other little conference happening in Davos, you may have heard <laughs> of it, um, where they're doing a lot of discussion on the future of work. So this is broader than just healthcare, right? We're talking about jobs being automated by AI, mm -hmm. and there is a real fear in the medical community about this happening. I mean, part of it's because of how um, often the messaging gets transmitted to non-technical people. Well, you'll see headlines like, you know, robot beats doctor at diagnosing yeah. cancer, right? So it's already being framed as adversarial. Mm -hmm. So some of it's just in the zeitgeist, that's how it's being narrated. But what, what would be, what are your thoughts on doc, for doctors who genuinely fear that AI is either gonna take over their jobs or they'll be out of a job? And there they are, by the way, having spent so many years of their life and so much money being educated in this field. So before I answer the specific question that you asked about, um, about doctors, I want to speak to the broader phenomenon of the media hyperbole about robots are going to take over the world. <laughs> because you hear that so much, including from people where you think, boy, this person ought to know better. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not anywhere close to you know, a, a general AI that can do I everything can that we do and, and basically put us, um, you know, start taking over the world a la Terminator. We're not there. Computers are getting better and better 
at very clearly defined um, uh, pattern recognition tasks that are becoming uh, broader in their scope in the sense that they are now, uh, we're able to do problems that we weren't able to do before. But you take a, a computer program that can recognize, a, that can identify images and you ask it to do anything with whatever natural language, I mean, it's, it's completely stumped. So it's not general AI and robots are not going to take over the world anytime soon. Now, to your question, I do agree that the biggest risk from AI is really the, um, the fact that it will take over certain job categories, including many job categories that people weren't expecting right. AI to be able to perform. Right. Um, not, not just in a medical profession, in a legal profession, I think the role of paralegals is definitely a very significant risk. Right. Uh, but I think the hope is, and I think that is certainly true in medicine, I don't know about all other professions, is that what will happen is that we won't make doctors obsolete, but rather the doctors will move to a higher level of, of job that I think is actually fundamentally important. So I'd like to use as an analogy um, the, the fear that came about in the banking industry when automated teller machines were invented. It's like, oh, all tellers, all, all bank uh, employees are going to be put out of a job. That actually didn't happen. Rather, they became, uh, uh, they started to perform other job categories, like spending more time with people talking about their loans, and um, and banks were now able, because of the reduced cost, to open um, to open branches in underserved areas that didn't really have a bank. Um, a branch bank. So um, I think the same thing will happen to doctors. Uh, doctors are currently able to spend five, ten minutes with a patient before the clock um, ends and they're supposed to go to the next patient because of the ridiculous costs that, um, that are incurred. Um, there's large parts, even in the United States and certainly in other parts of the world, that are completely underserved in terms of key medical professions. And right now, we just don't have the ability to fill that need because of, the, because of the costs involved. If we're able to provide the basic level of medical care to people very cost effectively because of automation, because of smart AI, that will leave that higher end of service where you really need to talk to a patient to understand what's going on, to offer them advice on how to deal with a chronic condition and so on. Um, I think they will, uh, people will be better served um, and will be able to offer high quality medical care to a much larger number of people, hopefully at a reduced cost. That sounds really phenomenal. So the goal here might be to um Again, I guess this is sort of your mission, the general idea of democratization. So really, yeah. it's a democratization of healthcare to yeah. make things more readily available. Absolutely. No, I, I think that's right. And I think it's also a matter of improving the quality of healthcare that's offered to people. Because when someone is spending five minutes with a doctor, there just really isn't enough time for the doctor to really dig into what is the problem. Um, you look at radiologists or pathologists who are spending five to 10 minutes with a sample, and they're looking for the very specific thing that they were told to look for and sometimes they catch it and sometimes they don't, but they don't have a chance to really look at the image more broadly and figure out if there's other things that they should be noticing. I mean, there's so many ways in which I think the quality will improve with, um, with machine assistance, which will not replace doctors, but rather enhance the quality of the care that they're able to provide. So where do you think, how do you think is the best way to get this message across? So I, I agree with you. And the work I do, which is more broadly about responsibility, I struggle with this as well. Uh, I used to start every talk by saying there are three things I don't talk about, Terminator, Skynet, and Silicon Valley <laughs> entrepreneurs saving the world, right? <laughs> so it's, it's really about people, it's about democratization. Mm -hmm. But you know, as I mentioned, and it, it makes sense in the way you know, the media world works, social, the social media world works, everything is about what is that bait, what is that hook? It's much better, it's, it's, you get so many more clicks by saying, AI beats human at X, Y, Z, right? As if this AI cares to beat anybody at anything, right? Yeah. Um, and it's a lot, le it's a lot less of a, a hook if you say artificial intelligence will help doctors provide a higher standard of care. So, but, but it's a necessary dialogue to have. So, what's the best way to engage and again further democratize this message that this is what you're trying to build? 
I wish I had a good answer to that question. It's a question that we clearly face not just in the context of this dialogue, but in right. many other dialogues where clickbait type uh, fake news is, is uh, much more attractive to people than the real thing, which is much more boring and mundane. And it's what causes the polarization of society in so many other ways where people just don't understand the facts because they, they're drawn to the most uh, uh, sensationalistic headlines. Yeah. So I think it's a question that, I, boy, if I had the answer to that, I, that would be a wonderful, a yeah, that, well, or a big help to many of the companies that are now struggling with this. Yeah. I think one of the important pieces, though, is for those of us who actually do understand the reality of the situation, to be vocal about conveying that narrative. Um, both in terms of our interactions with the media, our interactions with friends and others who are in the lay public, and to the extent that any of us have an opportunity to talk to people who are influential and don't get it, of which there are a number, really try and hammer home that message. If this is what AI is, and this is what, at least today, it's not, um, and really try and reduce the sort of uh, hyperbole on both sides. Right, and I, I agree with you. I think as practitioners, there is a responsibility we have to yeah. make sure that, and you know, the media will is really hungry for everything we have to deliver, and it is very tempting to deliver this hyperbolic, you know, thirty-second message. Um, but we do have to be more aware of, and more uh, proactive, maybe, mm -hmm. about sharing what the limitations are. Because right. this is what our AI can not do. It can do all this amazing stuff, of course. Please focus on that. But also, you know, here are the ways in which it's not replacing a person or, you know, it's not as easy. And I think I'm seeing some, you know, people are talking about, for example, robot taxes. And I think in their heads, people literally imagine as if like you have a factory with people and then you just replace a person with a robot yeah. and it looks like that. That's not how it looks no, at all. No, it's not. But I actually think that um, this is an important imperative for all of us because I really worry that this hyperbole is not only going to create uh, bad publicity for the field, it also may lead us to the next AI winter. And I've lived through a couple of these AI winters in the past that happened when the hyperbole greatly exceeded the reality of what the field was able to deliver. I think this one would be a real shame if we ended up in another one of those AI winters because I think today machine learning and AI have actually delivered a lot of value so unlike some of the earlier iterations the value is incredibly large but if we keep promising or scaring people uh, these are just two sides of the coin um, value that is way beyond what current technology can offer that's just going to create a disappointment um, that will come back to bite us in I don't know when a year or two or whatever and say well you said you were gonna get us to human level AI and it's a year later and we're not there yet uh, and I think that's a real risk. We, we saw that sort of uh, um, Gartner hype cycle in the context of Coursera. We didn't drive it, but we were uh, victims of it, if you will, where in 2012, um, the New York Times declared that it to be the year of the MOOC, and it was MOOCs are going to put all universities out of business and so on and so forth. We never subscribed or, uh, or even uh, aspired to that narrative, but it was out there. And then 2013, 12 months later, it's like MOOCs are dead because you universities are still around. I mean, uh, it's a kind of a ridiculous position, but I mean, universities, many of them have been around for 500, 600 years, and they will be around for a lot longer still. Uh, but because there was that ridiculous hype around MOOCs, um, we had the trough of the Gartner cycle be much lower. And I really wouldn't want machine learning to have to experience that same thing because of an excess of hyperbole. Absolutely. And if anything, we've seen what we actually saw was this hybrid of universities and yeah. online courses. I mean, Coursera was the example of that. You have Johns Hopkins, you have Stanford, right? right. Exactly. And, and that's and academia is shifting the way it teaches to embrace the need and the market right. due to MOOCs, which is, again, while the accurate narrative, not as fun, possibly, <laughs> as selling as like, oh, this thing is going to explode, and then, oh, it didn't explode, so it's, it's a right. fail. Um, so it's, it's, it's really up to us to make sure we don't enter into this or subscribe to this sort of hyperbolic language. With machine learning, Yeah, exactly. with machine learning and, and AI in general, although there is so much amazing promise. Absolutely. There's so much, I mean, every person here, all, all the speakers are just really phenomenal. They have yeah. really, really great things happening. So it's really been really wonderful to get this perspective. And my last question to you is, as I started this talk by saying you're an inspiration to many particular inspiration to me as well, and probably a lot of women in the field, as you are one of very few women, particularly from the early days of the industry. Um, and what we're seeing now is a very strong movement as more and more women are in this field to fight against 
uh, certain aspects of Silicon Valley culture that have mm -hmm. been dismissive or uh, you know out and out exploitative of women. Right. So do you have any thoughts about all these movements happening? Yeah. So first of all, I greatly admire and laud the courage of all of those women who have spoken out in the last few months um, in the Me Too movement in exposing some of those horrendous experiences that they've had to face as being women in the field. Um, I think it's it's terrifying that this is happening, but hopefully that uh, making that public and airing it out will reduce the occurrence of this in the future, and it certainly at least sensitized companies to, um, to that uh, to that happening and that the fact that they really need to be proactive in, in preventing that. Um, I personally haven't experienced the sort of most severe examples of what we're hearing about in the media and I'm very grateful for that. But if you can go to the next level um, of, of just the day-to-day aspects of being a woman in a male-dominated field. I mean, that's definitely been uh, something that I've seen a lot of and experienced myself. I can probably list, I don't know, dozens of examples of places where that's happened, uh, places where people who met myself and a male faculty member would refer to them as Professor X and to me as Daphne. I don't mind being called Daphne. I mean, everyone does that, but that, that weird imbalance was there. Uh, maybe my favorite example along those lines was a time when I was at Coursera when I was introduced to um, a CEO of another company, a big company, as, you know, this is Daphne Kohler, the uh, uh, co-founder and CEO of, of Coursera, and I and it was in the context of setting up a meeting, and I respond saying, oh, it's really nice to be connected, and my assistant James will be in touch to uh, arrange a time for the meeting. And the response was, um, dear Daphne, thank you very much. Could you please confirm James's availability for this in the state? <laughs> and, and this is just one of many, many examples along those lines. So I think it's, and I'm sure those of you who are women in the audience, those few of you, unfortunately, who are women in the audience, must have experienced many such examples. I'm sure you've experienced many times when you're the only woman in the room and you've made a comment and the conversation just continues and three minutes later one of your male colleagues makes the exact same comment and everyone says, what a great idea. <laughs> and you don't know whether to say something and come across as strident and, and sort of seeking credit or just to let it go as you've let it go so many times in the past. And then and, how long do you let it go? And how long do you let it go and right. how often do you let it go? And it's not a question that has an easy answer. So I wish I had a, I mean, it's not as horrible, I guess. I mean, clearly as, as, the, as the, the experiences that we hear about in the Me Too movement, but it's pernicious and it's ubiquitous and the only thing I can tell all of you in this room, men as well as women, is if you see that happening to one of your female colleagues, you should speak up too. It's actually much more powerful if you speak up and say, hey, Debbie said that three minutes ago, than if Debbie has to speak up. Right. And there are so many amazing ways that men can be allies yeah. that are not about confrontation. Yeah. So, you know, human nature, when we experience these microaggressions, we tend to internalize because we think it's our fault. Am I crazy? Am I being hyperbolic, right? right. Am I exaggerating? Mm -hmm. happens Oversensitive, over hysterical, right. some right. of the words that are being, that used, are being right? used. But then as a, as a male ally, you can definitely lend that authority that you just automatically have by being male. Um, when you see it happening, and again, it doesn't have to be confrontational, it's just as simple as saying, oh yeah, I think Debbie said that earlier, mm -hmm. and, and I, the Obama administration, um, they were doing, they were calling it amplifying women. So as a woman would make a statement, then another person would repeat it and say, Daphne just said, as Daphne just said, etc. So there's all these really amazing ways that we can really combat, um, and, right. and you know, it's not any individual's fault, it's just, you know, societally, we have this, this institutionalized bias mm -hmm. that we're trying to combat and it, it's something that benefits all of us to combat not just women right yeah. I mean like I like I mentioned you're an amazing human being right um, and there's so many amazing women and men out there mm -hmm. who could be the next Daphne she's gonna get super embarrassed <laughs> who could be the next Daphne um, and on that note I would very much like to thank you for coming here and thank, thank you, you for your thoughts as well thank you very much thank you.